Hello everyone. So let's continue with the diseases of the central nervous system. I'm going to, to divide uh, this lecture into two parts so that each portion will not be too big for you. So we all have about 10 power 11 neurons in our brains in our brains and the neurons have one unique characteristic called selective vulnerability selective vulnerability each part of the brain tends to be affected by particular disease just like some disease some diseases prefer to affect some parts of the brain in particular and the types of the cells are also important for example neurons tend to be injured much easily much easier than other types of cell other glial cells and the central nervous system is known for its incapability to undergo cell division. So we know that brain tissue is a good example of permanent tissue. Neurons are permanent cells, meaning that in adults, neurons are not dividing. They have already exited the cell cycle. They are not in the cell cycle anymore. So that's why we have to keep our neurons very well. Don't damage them too much. So don't uh, be too stressful. Just relax. Happiness uh, is good for our health. Unique characteristics of the central nervous system includes protective bony structure which protects our brain, our central nervous system from any injury. Auto regulation of the cerebral blood flow. The blood flow supplying the central nervous, nervous system needs to be regulated so that our brain will have enough blood supply all the time because our brain is very important. Without brain, we all die. And the brain has met metabolic substrate requirements. Neurons are very active. Neurons are very active, so they require a lot of uh, metabolic substrates. They require a lot of oxygen, and oxygen is one uh, important substrate for the brain. Without oxygen, our brain will die within four to five minutes. And our brain does not have conventional lymphatic system. So the good part, the benefit of this is that when we have any tumor in the brain, it is unlikely that the cancer will metastasize to other organs. But the bad part of this is that when the brain has edema, it is very difficult to reduce it to reduce the excess fluid the brain also has a unique cerebral cerebral spinal fluid circulation so just recall this circulation right the csf is produced from choroid plexus which is located in the ventricular system right and then the csf will flow into the third, fourth ventricles, and then uh, we'll exit the ventricles through the Laska and Majongdi lumina, right? The Laska L retinal. So we have two Laska lumina, and we have one Majongdi lumen, and then CSF will enter the subarachnoid space and then the CSF will be drained to the arachnoid granulation 
went to the superior sargenal sargental venous sinus. So just leave you this uh, circulation. And the brain also has limited immunologic surveillance. And the brain has distinctive response to injury and wound healing. Wound healing in the brain does not cause fibrosis, but gliosis instead. The astrocytes will work as fibroblasts in wound healing in the brain. So let's start with neurocytopathology. So normally our brain has four types of cells. Uh, neurons, glial cells, meninges, and blood vessels. So neurons uh, is the head. Every other types of cells need to protect the neurons because uh, the neuron is the most important cell in the brain and the neurons the axon is also just like some parts of the brain the axon there's like some new some axons are wrapped by myelin sheath also and this myelin sheath is produced by oligodendrocyte oligodendrocyte which is quite similar to Schwann cells of the peripheral nerve. Unlike Schwann cell, oligodendrocytes are so kind, so it will produce myelin for uh, every axons that are coming near them. So just like one as oligodendrocyte will be responsible for myelin sheath of more than one axon, whereas one Schwann cell is responsible for one nerve fiber. And another type of glial cell is astrocyte. As the name implies, the shape of the cell is like a star. It's like a star. So many uh, processes. Even though we don't see the processes when we stain the tissue with the H and E stain, but when we do the silver stain, we may be able to observe the star shape of this type of cell. This is a very important supporting cell. So it supports the nerve, it supports the neurons, it supports, it, it, it is responsible for blood brain barrier, right? And it is also responsible for tissue repair of the brain. So it has a lot of function and it is the most just like it is responsible for the most common type of brain tumor also astrocytoma I mean uh, the, the, the tumor within the brain tissue and then we have also we also have ependymal cell ependymal cells are lining the ventricular uh, channels so they are lining the ventricles and then there is another type of glial cell but this is pseudo glial pseudo glial cells because they are derived from mesoderm they are derived from the bone marrow not neuroectoderm like other types of cells so uh, this is a uh, microglial cells or microglia it is responsible for immune immuno uh, immune surveillance of the central nervous system and this figure shows uh, neurons I would like to highlight neurons here here is the pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex and on the right side can you recall this is Perkin J cells just like Perkin J cells are lie, lying on the beach so if I say that this is the sea and this is the land, so uh, lying on the beach uh, are the Perkin J cells. They, the Perkin J cells are neurons also. Pyramidal cells are also neurons also are also neurons. But you can see that that shape is that shapes are much different. 
จะแสดงพอ in พอ private d o s พอ Perkins Jay sells the sales are quite big with very prominent nucleus whereas the private d o s sales the sales are smaller and more purple something like that and this figure demonstrates the homunculus so uh, the sensory cortex and motor cortex so homunculus will demonstrate which part of the motor and sensory cortex are responsible for uh, which organs so just try to memorize the lower extremities are taken care by this area of the brain lower extremities the whole leg the whole legs just like require only a small area of the brain for sensory function and motor function whereas we see the upper extremity only hands uh, require quite large area of the brain tissue and our mouth we can see that our, we use our mouth a lot right we use it to talk we use it to eat oh we use it all the time that is why uh, it requires a huge area of the brain to take care of sensation and of motor function and another point i would like you to uh, memorize is that the foot area is here so when there is any problem with the anterior cerebral artery the lower extremities will be affected much more than the upper extremity in contrast if there is any problem with middle cerebral artery which comes from the lateral side right so the upper extremities will be affected more so the degree of weakness the degree of sensory loss can determine which part of the brain which branch of the cerebral arteries is affected and the changes of the neurons i would like you to know are these so the first one the most important one anoxic neurons or you can call it red neurons it is seen in hypoxia it is seen in ischemia as the name implies anoxic right so when the neurons are dying we expect to see some irreversible cell injury irreversible cell injury features so as i taught you some time ago uh, the two main things that we can observe in cells that are irreversibly injured one is eosinophilia of the cytoplasm right so here we see eosinophilia of the cytoplasm second we expect to see some nuclear change so here we see pyknosis of the nucleus Okay. these two are characteristics of anoxic neurons of red neurons just remember it so we will see these changes in hypoxia we will see these changes in ischemia and we will see these changes in tissues brain tissues that are undergoing infarction yeah just remember this this is the first sign that we can observe in brain tissue that is dead the first sign that we can observe when the brain tissue is dead second change second change uh, central chromatolysis chromatolysis so when there is axonal injury the neuron body will try to sprout it will try to grow its axon and just like the cell body will produce a lot of things within the cell body 
So we will see the phenomenon called central chromatolysis. Central chromatolysis. Normally, the cytoplasm of the neurons contains uh, nissle substance, nissle substance, which is RNA, which is RNA. So when the cell body is trying to produce a lot of things, these nissle substances will be diluted, will be diluted. So the granules, the colorful granules will be gone. So that's why we call it central chromatolysis, central chromatolysis. And in storage diseases, we may observe accumulation of some substance within the cell, within the neurons also. So we will see the cell changes in storage diseases. And when we stain the cells with a silver stain, uh, BL scurvy stain, we may observe the shape and the processes of the neurons. This one I would like to highlight anoxic neuron, the first reliable sign of brain infarct. Inside and outside neurons, uh, there may be accumulation of different stuff uh, according to the pathogenesis of the diseases. I don't like tables, but this table explains a lot. So if you can grasp some idea here, when I uh, mention some diseases, you may be able to recall uh, their association of different types of proteins. The first one, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. It is a prion disease. It is a prion disease. So the protein accumulation is prion protein. Prion protein is uh, an normally our cells, our body, our brain has prion protein, but when there is conformation change, when there is abnormality, abnormality in the conformation of the prion protein, the protein is accumulated. The protein uh, is changed from alpha helix to beta pleated sheet, and this. Uh, isoform cannot be digested, so the protein is accumulated, resulting in cell death, resulting in uh, sponginess of the brain. So the brain will be filled with these accumulated proteins. So the location is extracellular. Uh, extracellular. Uh, the second one, AD, stands for Alzheimer's disease. The protein that is accumulated is amyloid precursor protein, amyloid precursor protein, which is a normal protein within the neurons. But when there is conformation change from alpha helix to beta helix, so this requires the process called uh, uh, the, the enzymatic process by syncretase, as I, I will mention again later on. So there will be accumulation of amyloid precursor protein and the abnormal protein of amyloid precursor protein is called amyloid beta. Amyloid beta. Just try to put into your memory. Amyloid precursor protein, accumulation of this, uh, the protein that is accumulated is called amyloid beta. And the lesion that amyloid beta is seen is called neuritic or sinai plaque. Okay. So the deposition is extracellular. And the third line, tauopathies, tau including Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is a type of tauopathies. Tauopathies uh, describe the diseases resulting from accumulation of tau protein. Tau is a microtubule binding protein, but when there is hyperphosphorylation of this protein, uh, tau is accumulated within the cell 
and the lesion is called neurofibrillary tangle. Neurofibrillary tangle. The location is intracellular. And the next one, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease. The protein that is accumulated is alpha synuclein, and the lesion that is seen is called Lewy body. Lewy body. The location is cytoplasmic. It affects uh, the different parts of the brain, particularly at the substantia nigra. And so previously I talked about the changes in neurons. Now I'm going to move to other types of cells. Uh, astrocytes are very difficult to see uh, on a histologic section. We will see them as just like pale nuclei, oval nuclei like this. When there is injury to the brain tissue, when there is neuron death, so the tissue is repaired by gliosis, gliosis. So the astrocytes will proliferate and uh, will become hyperplastic and hypertrophic. The hypertrophic astrocytes are called gemistocytes. gemistocytes. So we will be able to see the cytoplasmic boundary of the cells. The nuclei will be pushed to the periphery. Unlike the, uh, just like normal exercise, we don't see the cytoplasmic bodily, right? And using silver stain, we will see the star shape of the cells, star shape of the cells. And here, this figure demonstrates its contribution to blood-brain barrier. And other changes include losenthal fibers, which is seen in some types of tumors, amyloid, corpora, amyracia, which is normally seen in the uh, prostate gland, right? But here we also uh, have corpora amyracia. It is a different one, a, a different thing. It is not the same as the um, corpora amyracia in the prostate gland, and it is seen in uh, the elderly. And in those who have uh, hyperammonemic encephalopathy or hepatic encephalopathy, we will see the empty nuclei like this. Just like these cells are called Alzheimer's type 2 astrocyte, even though they are not associated with uh, Alzheimer at all. And so the next type of the glial cells is oligodendrocytes. We will see them as just like fried eggs, fried eggs, they have fried egg appearance. They have halo surrounding the nucleus. The nucleus is round, the nucleus is dark, and that is pearly, just like halo surrounding the nucleus like this. So uh, a fried egg appearance. So the, the, the halo surrounding the nucleus is caused by tissue artifact. And the next type of the glial cell is uh, uh, ependyma, ependymal cells. Uh, the ependymal cells are lining the ventricles. And when there is uh, erosion, when there is erosion of the ventricular surface, uh, the underlying exercise will proliferate. So we will see the lesion as the uh, ependymal granulations. And so as I mentioned earlier, the cells responsible for immune surveillance is microglia. Microglia is pseudoglia because it is not derived from neuroectoderm. It is derived from uh, the hemato, from hematopoietic system. It, 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 is, it comes from the bone marrow. It is responsible for immune surveillance. So when there is brain infection, which is called encephalitis, and the main cause is encephalitis is virus infection, viral infection. So when there is viral encephalitis, we expect to see the microglia 
uh, the reactive microglial cells. The microglial cells uh, will, uh, the nucleus will become elongate, elongated, elongated. So we will see a uh, slender nuclei like this. So these cells are called rod cells. They are reactive microglial cells. And these rod cells will be accumulated into a nodule. And this nodule is called microglial nodule. Microglial nodule. It is non-specific. It is seen in uh, viral encephalitis uh, when uh, there is invaders into the brain tissue. And the microglia is also responsible for uh, digestion, for eating up of the dead neurons, so neuronal phagia, and also macrophages, uh, microglia and perivascular monocytes are responsible for the jitter cell, G-I-T-T-E-R, jitter cells, which is seen in brain infarction, seen in brain infarction. And other components outside the brain tissue uh, uh, include a uh, scalp, skin, connective tissue, upper neurotic, loose allular connective tissue, pericranium, and we have three layers of meninges, pia, arachnoid, dura, and underneath the arachnoid uh, is subarachnoid space. I would like to highlight a little bit that uh, major blood vessels are us uh, uh, usually lie within the subarachnoid uh, space, uh, including the circle of villus. That is why when there is major injury, when there is injury of the major blood vessels in the brain, uh, the result is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, I would like to start with the general mechanisms of the brain diseases. So brain edema, brain edema. Uh, there are three types of brain edema. Brain edema describes accumulation of excess fluid within the brain tissue, maybe outside the cell or inside the cell. So vasogenic edema results from uh, uh, results from increased permeability of the blood vessels there may be damage to blood vessels there may be anything that uh, distort or uh, interfere with the blood vessels so the tissue will have vasogenic edema uh, the causes include cerebral vascular accident or stroke trauma tumor infection anything anything that uh, result in increased vascular permeability or uh, will, will result in vasogenic edema. So when there is a tumor, the tumor will push the blood vessels surrounding the mass. So the blood vessels will uh, be injured and just like that may be uh, the loss of integrity of the blood vessel. So there may be increased vascular permeability. So if the tumor is growing very quickly, so we may be able to see a lot of vasogenic edema surrounding the mass. And the next type is cytotoxic edema. So cytotoxic meaning that the cause is something that results in neuron, neuronal injury, neuronal injury. So from anoxic, toxic metabolic disturbances causing uh, increased sodium influx into the cells. If you recall, the anoxia results in ATP depletion. ATP depletion results in inadequate function of sodium potassium pump. So the end result is edema because the sodium comes into the cells without uh, anything to pump it out. Uh, so this is a cause of cytotoxic edema. And interstitial edema is a separate entity describing uh, the, the, the edema surrounding the ventricular system uh, as a result of increased intraventricular pressure. This is edema, excess fluid within the brain tissue. So in the edematous brain, we will say uh, flattening of the 
ใจ Rai and narrowing of the s a u k a i This is brain edema. We say flattening because the brain tissue is pushing towards the skull. So we will say the surface of the j a i r i uh, is flattened, is flattened, and we will say that the s a u k a i also narrowed. And if there is excess CSF fluid within the ventricular system, that is hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus. So the the ventricle, ventricles will be enlarged, enlarged. So there are two types of hydrocephalus: communicating and non-communicating. Um, I think most cases should be the second type. Uh, because uh, when there is obstruction of anywhere in the CSF pathway, there will be non-communicating hydrocephalus. The areas proximal to the obstruction will become enlarged, whereas uh, the area distal to the obstruction will be normal. And communicating meaning that all channels, all uh, cavities within the pathway, uh, just like everywhere is enlarged, everywhere is enlarged, everywhere is affected. So too much CSF within the ventricular system is hydrocephalus. So in children, because the sutures, fontanelles are not closed, so we expect to see. The head of the children are enlarged, They are enlarged, but the pressure will not be very high because uh, the volume can uh, be increased by enlargement of the head. But in adults, because the sutures are closed, some fontanelles are closed, so we expect to see uh, a quick. Increase in intraventricular pressure, in CSF pressure, but the head circumference will remain the same. We will not see head enlargement uh, in adults. And there is another condition called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. This is not a true hydrocephalus. CSF is increased. The ventricular system is enlarged, but Uh, these changes result from brain atrophy. The brain tissue is decreased, so the ventricular system is enlarged. So, and this is called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. It is a feature that can be seen in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease. Increased intracranial pressure. So, uh, we will uh, call this condition when. The mean CSF pressure exceeds uh, 200 m i l l i m e t e r water in the recumbent position. The recumbent position. When there is an increase in intracranial pressure, the brain tissue will try to accommodate. When there is in something filling the 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 brain the the uh, cranium filling. The head, feeling in within the head, the brain tissue will try to accommodate. So uh, the soft parts of the brain will be compressed first. The veins, the ventricular system will be compressed first, and then when at, in the end, when the compensation is uh, limited, when the compensation is impossible, uh, is can cannot. We, when the brain cannot accommodate anymore, the CSF pressure will become increased a lot. So the intracranial pressure can result from mass effects, maybe from diffuse brain edema or maybe from any focal lesion that fills the space, fill the space within the cranium. So the one equation I would like to show you is. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Cerebral perfusion perfusion pressure needs to be maintained 
need to be maintained because we don't want our brain tissue to be hypoxic to be ischemic right so i want to highlight this one because it explains the phenomenon seen in cases with intracranial pressure uh, increase intracranial pressure so when icp intracranial pressure is increased our body will try to maintain cpp cerebral perfusion pressure and one measure to maintain this one is by increasing the blood pressure so we expect to see hypertension in patients with increased intracranial pressure it is a result of body compensation to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure and these changes i would like to you to know them all uh, because these are signs of increased intracranial pressure we can save one's life by knowing these signs when these people come to the clinic when come to the opd if we know if we observe these changes we will be able to detect serious disease inside the body headache uh, headache so the headache is more severe at night because uh, at night when the when just like when we lie down at when we sleep at night we just like we will lie down right so it is easier for the blood to uh, be pumped from the heart to the brain so the blood supply to the brain will be increased while sleeping and when while we are sleeping uh, the ventilation is decreased we will breathe slower right we will sl breathe slower than when we wake up so our body will suffer less puritary acidosis to some degree so and that is reflex vasodilation in the head in the brain so the headache is severe at night while sleeping the headache may be severe enough to wake the patients up at night and vomiting is also a feature and the unique characteristics of vomiting in this condition is called projectile vomiting projectile vomiting so the patients will vomit very strongly so be careful or you just like the vomit will may come to your face when you doing the when you do the physical examination and papilledema because the optic nerve is surrounded by meninges uh, optic nerve uh, is surrounded by csf so when there is increased csf pressure optic nerves is compressed so we expect to see papilledema papilledema however the change is not observed immediately after the uh, the event but it requires about three to four days uh, to to appear to appear alteration of consciousness is also a sign and vital signs are very important we will see vital sign changes which is which are called coaching response or coaching reflex coaching response or coaching reflex there are three features uh, increased blood pressure with wine pulse pressure it is wine pulse pressure hypertension meaning that the say, systolic blood pressure is very very high whereas the diastolic blood pressure is normal a little bit increase or decrease anyway but the pulse pressure is very wide wide gap wide uh, pulse pressure hypertension wide pulse pressure hypertension and auricular breathing this uh, is supposed to be the result of the interference of the respiratory center and bradycardia which explains the increased blood pressure because uh, in order to increase the cardiac output we need enough time for the blood filling right so bradycardia allows enough blood to enter into the heart so that uh, the heart can pump harder 
the heart can pump harder, resulting in hypertension, wide pulse pressure hypertension. And another sign that can be observed is cranial nerve 6 palsy. Because this cranial nerve uh, has its way within the CSF so long, just like long way within the uh, CSF. So that is why this nerve is affected the earliest compared to other uh, cranial nerves. And there is blur vision, which may be explained by papilledema. And in children, we may be able to observe tensed fontanelles, tensed fontanelles. Uh, on the radiograph, we may see X-ray change. And the last thing that I would like to tip, but that we would like to avoid is uh, brain herniation. Brain herniation. Brain herniation is the most severe complication of increased intracranial pressure. And it is the reason that we need to treat the patients very early. We need to treat the patients. We need to try to reduce the intracranial pressure rapidly to prevent this complication. And there are three types of herniations that you must, you should know. The first one, subfalsing herniation, subfalsing herniation. So the singular gylus is protruding into, that's like uh, under the fox cerebri. So that's why it is called subfalsing herniation. So this herniation may affect the anterior cerebral artery. The second one, transtentorial or ankle herniation. The uncus uh, herniates through uh, the tentorium cerebelli. Tentorium cerebelli. So this herniation is called transtentorial herniation. And the last one, tonsillar herniation, the cerebellar tonsin protrudes through the foramen magnum here. So uh, this one will result in the injury of the brainstem and possibly a cerebral artery. This condition is easy to treat because the patients will die anyway because the cardiovascular and respiratory centers are destroyed, uh, are just like by, uh, impaired by this herniation. The most interesting one is transcentorial herniation. So this herniation may result in cranial nerve, the third cranial nerve injury usually of the third cranial nerve. Second, uh, the herniation will push the cerebral peduncle to the opposite side and the peduncle will hit at the opposite side of the tentorium cerebelli. And there may be injury to the nerve fibers here on the opposite side. So this is Kernohan notch. Kernohan notch. So it is interesting because when there is a mass, when there is a lesion on the right side, we expect to see weakness on the left side. That is just predictable. But when there is transtentorial herniation and when there is kernel hand knot here, the nerve fiber here is destroyed, is injured by, is injured by uh, the the heat by the heat on the tentorium cerebelli. So a nerve fiber here will supply the right side of the body, right? So at first, for, this is for example, when there is a problem with the right side of the brain, we expect to see the problem with the left side of the body. But when there is transcentorial herniation, we may observe the weakness, we may observe neural deficit on the same side of the region, which is very really special. It is impossible without herniation, right? Because the nerve fibers here will cross over on the, just like on the, in the brain stem, right? But when there is transcentral herniation, the injury will result in the weakness on the same side, uh, on, the, on the body, the same side as the brain lesion. And this herniation may 
cause duet hemorrhage when there is the tilting of the cerebral peduncle the blood vessels inside is stretched so when the blood vessels is stretched when there is injury to blood vessels there may be duet hemorrhage duet hemorrhage and uh, this herniation may result in uh, occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery and if you can remember posterior cerebral artery supplies occipital lobe or supplies visual cortex right so the patient may have contralateral homonymous hemianopia which you need to do some review because I have no time to explain everything. The time is very limited. Here is uh, just like an impression of the transtensorial herniation. So this is Melroy. Is this an impression caused by the pushing on the trans uh, the tensorium cerebelli? Okay. And here transtensorial herniation results in hitting of the opposite uh, of the cerebral peduncle on the opposite side to the tentorium cerebelli so we will have some degree of contusion or hemorrhage here and this one is uh, tonsillar herniation tonsillar herniation the cerebellar tonsin herniates through the foramen magnum into the spinal canal and then uh, the thing that comes with cerebral cerebellar tonsin is brainstem. So the brainstem is squeezed, the brainstem is injured by the herniation, and the patient is die. Uh, the patient dies. Uh, that's why we have specimen here. And the next topic uh, is malformations and devel developmental diseases. So for malformations, for malformations, we divide the conditions into uh, just like according to anatomic distributions. Uh, if the malformations result from abnormal neurotic formation, that is neurotic defect. If the malformations affect the forebrain, that is forebrain abnormalities. If the malformations affect the posterior fossa abnormalities, okay, uh, and if the Problem is with the spinal cord that is hydromyelia and sidingomyelia. And this is the most severe form of the neural tube defect. Neural tube defect, as the name implies, it has just like the pathogenesis is failure to form neural tube or the neural tube just leave opens after uh, it is formed. So, just recall that the neural tube formation takes place first in the cervical area, and that is zipping, zipping effect, right, from the cervical area, and uh, the zipping goes distally. So, the last portions that will be closed, the last portions that the neural tubes are formed uh, are the anterior pore and posterior pore, right? uh, anterior neural pore, posterior neural pore, right? When the anterior neural pore is affected, that is just like when the neural tube cannot be formed at the anterior neural pore, we can see the condition like this, and then cephry and then cephry. Actually, the baby has a small amount of brain tissue here but very tiny, right? And it is not compatible with life, so the babies will die at birth. Uh, okay. So all neural tube defects have the same uh, risk factor, which is folate deficiency. Folate deficiency. Folate is required for development of the nervous system. So when someone is planning to have a child, just advise the person to take adequate folate, adequate folate. Because 
when we when the person knows that she is pregnant, that is too late to take for it. We need to take for it in advance, in advance, because the new love tip is formed very quickly, so it's like very early, right? very early, as you have studied embryology already. Uh, new love tip is formed very early uh, during the embryo, right? So we need to be prepared. For you who are female, just take for it in advance. It's like when you are in the sixth year, when you are sixth year medical student, and if you think that when you graduate, you will get married very soon, so just take for it. Don't let this happen to you. For it, okay. take for it. So for that deficiency is a factor for neural tube defect. And one biomarker for this condition is alpha fetoprotein. Alpha fetoprotein. The milder forms of neural tube defects are shown here. Some person will have abnormal closing of the posterior neural pore. So the babies may have meningomyelocele, and the mildest form is the spina bifida. Spina bifida, right? And here is also a milder form of the abnormal of the anterior neural pore meningoencephalocele, meningoencephalocele. So seal means uh, sac, uh, encephalo brain, meningo, meninges. So the sac is composed of meninges, brain, and uh, okay. and this sac is composed of meninges and uh, myelo means spinal cord, spinal cord inside. So all neural tube defects result from folate deficiency. Uh, folate deficiency is a, is a risk factor. And the figures here demonstrate uh, some examples of forebrain abnormality. For example, when there is no division between right and left hemispheres, that is holoprosencephaly. When there is no corpus callosum, that is a genesis of corpus callosum. And the post, uh, the high brain abnormalities in posterior fossa abnormalities include unknown sherry and a genesis of cerebellar vermis. I don't want to talk too much on this one. I think it is too much for you. And when there is uh, canals uh, within the spinal cord, uh, if the canal is within the spinal canal, which does, if the, that is enlargement of the spinal canal, that is uh, hydromyelia. But when there is a false tract apart from the spinal canal, that is syringomyelia, that is syringe within the uh, spinal cord. The next topic is perinatal brain injury. I know that you are familiar with this type of disease. We will call these persons uh, the CP, CP, cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy. So uh, the, the person shown in the figure uh, is, is normal, but she is acting as if she has cerebral palsy. And if you have watched uh, Ban Sai Tong, I think one member of the family uh, is affected, uh, has this disease. Cerebral palsy is defined as a non-progressive neurologic motor deficit characterized by a combination of spasticity, dystonia, ataxia, atetosis, and paresis, attributable to insults occurring during the prenatal and prenatal periods. Okay. The, during the delivery, during or maybe or just like usually perinatal period, uh, when there is accident, when there is something that interfere with uh, with a fetal blood supply, uh, the fetal brain may, may be damaged, and the damage is constant. I mean, after the baby is born, the damage remains constant. So the neuro deficits, neurological deficits, will remain the same throughout life. So the condition is non-progressive. The severity varies a lot from person to person. Some person may, the, the, 
some persons may have very mild neurological deficits. For example, foot drop. So we just do some rehabilitation or just uh, put some shoe, uh, put a shoe to the person so that he or she can walk. That is all. But some some patients have very severe form of the cerebral palsy and require uh, rehabilitation so that the persons the these patients can have full capacity as much as they can. And next, traumatic brain injury. So when there is injury to the skull, that is, uh, we may observe skull fractures, which are seen on the X-ray. Right? And when the severity is high, so the brain parenchyma may be affected, may be injured. Uh, the injury can be concussion, contusion, laceration, or diffuse external injury. And traumatic vascular injury is also a, an important topic I would like to highlight. Spinal cord injury, I think anatomy has taught you so much about this already. I will just mention about it very briefly. Concussion, when there is blunt trauma of the brain, uh, the brain is shocked. The brain is shocked. So uh, the patient will lose his consciousness. So that will that is loss of consciousness. Uh, the mechanism is interf interference of interference with the RAS system, reticular activating system. This system is interfered with uh, by the injury. So the brain just stop working, just like the consciousness is gone for a moment. But after resuscitation, the patient may wake up and nothing is wrong with him or her. He can walk, he can, just like all the neurological tests are negative. That is concussion, concussion. And if the severity is higher, there may be contusion, me fok cham, lured or within the brain parenchyma. Uh, so this is contusion, contusion. So when this blood is lysed, is digested, so we may see uh, just like let's do lesions like this, plug John. And if the severity is even higher. So we may observe laceration of the brain parenchyma. And the most severe form is diffuse external injury. This one we may observe only mind changes within the brain parenchyma, only scattered hemorrhage, only white matter injuries, uh, hemorrhage with the white matter like this one. So we don't expect the patient to die, but the patient is just, it is just uh, in a vegetative state, vegetative state, Ben Park. Uh, this one is explained by the shelling force, shelling injury of the axon. So there is external injury throughout the brain, external injury throughout the brain. So the axon is gone, is injured, and the patient cannot therefore uh, move his body, so in vegetative state. And another topic of the brain injury is the vascular injury. Right? And this figure is very important, big time. Okay. Uh, epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma. Epidural hematoma. The typical history is the injury at the temporal area and x-ray shows fracture of the temporal bone. So just recall that there is one artery just like passing by, right? It is midden meningeal artery. So when there is a fracture here, for example, when a person is hit at the temporal area, 
and there is fracture here. So the many bitten meningeal artery is broken. So the blood leaks from the blood vessel. So there is accumulation of the arterial blood within this area because it is artery. So the cause of the disease is very quick. So it is usually acute. It is usually acute. It is usually acute. Typical history for this one is the person is hit maybe by accident or someone hit him at the temporal area. There is fracture here. There is contusion in this area and the patient loses his consciousness immediately because of concussion, because of concussion, because the reticular activating system is interfered with. So the patient just loses his consciousness and then he comes back. So it's like, and the neurological test may be negative because the blood is not coming out enough uh, uh, much at that time. But six to eight hours later, the patient, the patient's condition is worse and worse, and he may has brain herniation. He may have brain herniation and he may die later on. So there is interval between the first episode of loss of consciousness and the deterioration of the neurological condition or maybe just like two episodes just like in the middle is called lucid interval l-u-c-i-d lucid interval this is very typical history of epidural hematoma lucid interval the first episode of loss of consciousness by concussion and the second episode of the loss of consciousness by uh, the increase of the blood arterial blood accumulation uh, and loss of consciousness and herniation so that is lucid interval this condition requires emergency treatment just burr hole just drain the blood out and the patient is saved on the opposite, on the right side, we see subdural hematoma. Uh, epidural, the name implies that it is just like outside, it is on the top of the dura. Right? Subdural, it is underneath the dura, underneath the dura. This condition is usually seen in elderly people. Elderly people have atrophic brain. And there is venous blood vessels coming to the surface of the brain. They are called bridging veins. Bridging veins. For, for when the brain is atrophic, the bridging veins are stretched. The bridging veins are stretched. And when there is mind injury, the brain is moving left, right, so moving within the uh, enlarged uh, CSF cavity right? because the brain is smaller so the CSF spaces are larger so the brain can move very much so the bridging vein is torn the bridging vein is torn but because it is venous blood vessels so the blood is venous blood so the breathing is slow the breathing is slow just like gradual so the patients may have gradual deterioration of the neurological conditions uh, so this is subdural hematoma so the is it is often seen in the elderly in the those who have atrophic brain those who have brain atrophy the blood vessel is bridging vein bridging vein on the left side, here we see the blood overlying the dura. The blood, it is the arterial blood. And because it is breathing so quickly, so we will see pushing of the hematoma. Right? So we will see the shape as lens shape hematoma. 
lens shape hematoma. Whereas on the right side, we see that the breathing is on the brain surface. It is underlying underneath the dura. It is subdural hematoma. We see the breathing is so slow and the breathing goes along the surface, right? So we will see it as crescentic hemorrhage, crescentic hematoma. Spencial pachat crescentic hematoma. And if there is a breaking of the major blood vessels within the brain, the major blood vessels lie in the subarachnoid space, right? So when there is uh, hemorrhage, we expect to see in the form as subarachnoid hemorrhage. And spinal cord injury, there are different kinds, uh, brow, sequat, anterior cord, posterior cord, central cord. So just relate this to anatomy of the different pathways within the spinal cord. So may I skip this one because of the time being. Okay, let me pause here a little bit. Uh, this is the end of the first part. So I uh, took a lot of time to explain the basic principles of the of the uh, changes of the brain pathology because uh, they require some explanation. But after this, I can go uh, faster. I can go faster. So please come back. Don't stop here. Just continue to the part two.